so how you consume information and how we deliver them sometimes it's all it hinges upon your motivation right mm-hmm. your discipline of trying to consume them and then it all again anchors back to because you're motivated because you're curious for a very specific things Welcome to The Brew. I'm your host, Valtteri Salamaki, and today we are joined by Ken Wang, who is a UC Riverside lecturer, also works for the county. Uh, we're going to be talking about why it's important to understand technology trends, but before we go into the main topics for today, Ken, can you um, give a little brief background about yourself? Sure, sure. Thanks, Val. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so I've been uh, kind of teaching as a lecturer for about 10 years, since 2010. Um, most of my career uh, since the late 90s has been around information technology, developer, tester. So I re- literally kind of came up uh, in my most of my profession as, a, as an IT guy that moved into project management and whatnot. And I went through uh, many different, uh, in my career, I worked for various different uh, industry or companies. Um, so the last 14 years, I actually joined the county of Riverside, and I, I started there as, a, as an IT manager uh, for one of the department. And you fast forward to to the reason uh, the last few years with the county, um, I I just came off of a, a large project to to replace the mainframe system um, for the whole county of Riverside, and literally to modernize it with the latest and greatest software. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what I have done. And for the last the two years, recent two years, I also spearheaded a lot of initiatives to try to now, now that I'm done with a big project, um, it's definitely try to understand where can we go from here <laughs> using and leveraging technology to, to drive more changes or efficiencies. So I kind of um, really enjoy teaching. Uh, so everything that I encountered at work, I really wanted to bring back to the school, uh, to, the, to the students. Um, so. Aside from that, um, do have uh, academically, uh, I am a business major in my undergrad, and then I eventually got my computer science master's and as well as MBA. So it really gives me that whole perspective of how this whole business and IT really need to tie together to uh, to achieve what we wanted to do. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think that's a that's a very important point that you brought up, which is like the understanding of both realms of technology as well as business applications. I, I, I think it's very important to be able to understand both, because if you just understand one side, um, it, your, your understanding of the real world might be a little bit construed because those <laughs> yeah. that are focused on computer science, they tech to, t- tend to be a little bit too lenient on like technology can solve everything. And then those that are very business savvy, but not might not understand technology is going to be the opposite, which is that <laughs> they, they think the old school way of doing it is the way that you can always do it. That's also not true. So at, at UCR, um, which, which, which courses do you currently teach? Um, I think the, most of the courses I always kind of teach, I really enjoy doing it. It's definitely the database one um, mm-hmm. because at the heart of it, you know, it's all about data, which I probably will have a chance to explain a little bit later. Um, e-commerce, electronic commerce, which is also a, a really great course, uh, mm-hmm. really kind of bring the students and open their mind in terms of what the internet really is offering uh, in the world of business, as well as individually, personally, uh, all this whole social media and all that stuff. Uh, I also teach uh, technology entrepreneurship, okay. uh, which really, really leverages my my you know business side of my brain. Um, that I'm able to to go through that discipline and see and guide people to think about how technology actually can be can be the business um, mm-hmm. and kind of open their mind to think that way. Uh, so those are are usually my three predominant predominant courses that I teach. Um, once in a while, I think once a year, I will teach a system analysis and design. Got it. Which just kind of really pulls my project management, you know, career. Uh, how do you actually see a system from inception and concept all the way to actually building them out and put them into into production, into the real business world? Yeah, and I, I think that's actually probably the most complicated one uh, out, of, out of them <laughs> just because everything else you can do as an independent um, idea but that yeah. one is kind of the start to finish pipeline which is a struggle for a lot of people because it's very hard <laughs> to rationalize the implementation of technology not just like what should you use but how do you actually then implement it into an idea so i mean go, going into the topic for today which is just uh-huh. focusing on why it's important to stay up with the trends i know, I know we we're talking a little bit um, offline just talking overall about like it's important to understand these trends because obviously COVID's changed a lot of things as well. But um, 
whether it becomes on private sector or a public sector, it doesn't really matter because if you're not changing with the times, it's going to cause kind of pushback between departments. It, it might cause mm -hmm. some troubles within them. So I, I guess one thing that that's interesting to me is like, how, how, how have you personally kind of seen this trend change faster now because of COVID? Um, that um, you need to stay up with the trends. You need to really understand yeah. like what's going on so that you can make these processes better. Yeah, definitely. I think COVID really expedited the, um, or, or at least surfaced this challenge mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, of just the individuals, right? At the, at the end of the day, regardless how big the organization is, it comes down to everybody's preference or their willingness, I guess, to accept change and how fast they usually individually handle them. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it, it, it is really kind of front and center over the last 12 months. Uh, even today, we're still dealing with some of the challenges there. You still have holdouts, right? People that still mm -hmm. kind of find different ways of saying why why we shouldn't be doing all this stuff. Um, but but I will take a step back to say, um, I'm, I'm going to use a kind of a long way to to maybe open this topic up, mm -hmm. uh, to kind of lay the groundwork. Just hopefully that will lay the foundation to kind of see a different perspective. Yep. So. We all heard of the old saying, um, you you give men a fish, you feed him for a day. Mm -hmm. Teach him other fish, right? You feed him for li lifetime. So let's let's take that saying and really picture, put, put a picture in your mind. You got this person that's rolling his bow out into the middle of the water who just learned how to fish. Mm -hmm. And then every day he's able to do that. He goes out in the morning and catch, you know, two hours, catch enough fish for the day and he will be fed. And then he can literally live out his life that way. Mm -hmm. No problem, right? Self-sufficient, awesome. Um, but let's let's expand that thought a little bit. Now let's let's say let's add a third verse to that saying to say, what do you think will happen if you give the same man a technology, a technology that will look underwater to tell you where the fishes are at, mm -hmm. a technology that will show you where the fishes are swimming towards because it reads the current. Uh, uh, a technology that will let you know the forecast of tomorrow and the seven and 10 days out. And let's let's go further, let's go extreme. What if you also give them, get this many information about how to leverage and use a bigger boat, how to build a bigger boat, how to use nets as opposed to a fishing rod. Now let's imagine if you give this person all this and he or she is willing to accept, comprehend, curious, learn, and so on and so forth. We have all this technology now wrapping around this individual. What mm -hmm. do you think the same person can achieve? I can assure you he's probably not going to be just feeding himself for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he or she can probably feed a civilization for eternity. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I wanted to to kind of anchor that thought to say, from that perspective, um, technology is kind of inevitable. But yet, if you if you kind of pull it back down from that perspective, you can understand the impact. Now let's look at this fisherman, uh, this individual person. Let's just say we have individuals. Back to your point, right? Mm -hmm. Holdouts, <laughs> people yeah. that it's, it's hard for them to fathom all this change, right? With technology. So let's, let's just assume this person is that way. I'm perfectly fine sitting on my little boat and spending two hours to catch a day of fish to feed myself. And I have no ambitions to, to feed a civilization. That's fine, right? People have preference and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, um, but let's just say this person goes out one day, all of a sudden he see a big boat that came along next to his little tiny boat. And that big boat somehow cast a huge white net it pulled up thousands and thousands of fish. Mm -hmm. Not just the fish that he's able to fish. I mean, you have lobsters, you have all kinds of variety. And then after a couple of days of that same thing happening, happening again, this individual person realized it now takes me five hours to fish the same amount of fish mm -hmm. to feed myself as opposed to normal two hours. So I guess my, my concept here using this saying is to say whether or not you believe it or you're willing or you want to or or, or um, to kind of just stay in your realm of how you prefer things to happen like i said i'm not saying those are wrong right everybody has their own preference but <laughs> technology changes is going to impact you yep whether or not you you're ready for it or, or you don't 
Now, as an educator, right? Preferably, I want everybody to be ready for it. It's、mm-hmm. not to say you have to go do something with it, but at least know why you're seeing things different that's impacting you, either positive or negative.、Mm-hmm. Uh, so, at the at the heart of that is there's no definitely nothing wrong with just being curious and, and keeping up with things to know how, why why does it work that way? Why am I seeing this, and why am I feeling something positive or negative? That I think will go a long way. It's not to say you have to react to it or do something with it,、mm-hmm. but but I think it will just make your make your lifetime a lot more meaningful and productive. And along the way, you'll just、uh, you'll just be fascinated and witnessing, right? How the world is actually evolving right in front of your eyes, and you kind of understand why. Yeah, and I I really really like that analogy because one thing you brought up into perspective as well is that. I mean, it, it goes into like adoption curves as well, which I'm not going to get too like <laughs> into, into marketing. But one one thing it does teach a lot of people is that、um, things will change no matter what. And then when you、yeah. when you when you're going to look at that comparison, so a, a small business looking at how some corp corporations are using technology to just build their businesses faster,、um, mm-hmm. you're going to notice that that gap grows and grows and grows. But the thing that becomes tangible to you is the value you could have if you're using it, right?、Yep. And it's、yep. and and I think at that point for a lot of people it might be a little too late. So that that is one thing I'm currently seeing.、Um, once COVID hit as well, it's just like a lot of small businesses were not really considering technology because lack of understanding, lack of knowledge behind it, but also just like not the, they 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 believe that the way they're doing businesses has worked and it will continue to work. But then they realize that, like, oh, I need a, a booking system. I need a online POS system. I need to be able to change using this technology.、Yeah. It's really hard to change very quickly. <laughs> it is easy to change over time and, and, and invest into it. So,、yeah. um, especially as as you're teaching students, and I know you pr- you provide a lot of、um, examples, and that that's one one reason why students really gravitate and understand the concepts that you're talking about.、Um, what what would you say are some、um, Ways that they should be looking or or being curious about these technology trends right now,、um, mm-hmm. because I mean personally for me, I always I always read what's on TechCrunch on like the latest tech news, and I know that that's something that's not going to matter for five years, but it's at least being、uh-huh. talked about right now. And then I look at what they're talking about on cable news as well, because I try to correlate. Okay, this is where it's going, and this is、uh-huh. what the problems they're saying is right now. That's personally for me how I kind of see these trends and how they're moving faster and faster and faster. But do you have、mm-hmm. some ways that students that are curious that can、yeah. um, learn a little bit more about technology and these trends and make sure they are caught up with the times? Yeah, that's a good point. I think、um, going back to to earlier comment about everybody is different, right? They、mm-hmm. have their own motivation,、um, own ways of learning, own ways of、uh, comprehending information. Uh, so it's definitely not to say everybody need to to do what we do. I、mm-hmm. mean, we're we, we're definitely. I'm in this field, and you definitely have a natural curiosity, and you're very interested in it. So you spend a lot, of, devote your your time to it. Yeah. But it's not to say you know everybody need to do so.、Mm-hmm. But everybody do have a driver,、um, right? So for example,、uh, <laughs> funny thing is recently I get a lot of inquiries about from my students about Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> right, you can imagine Bitcoin's all over the news, right? It's going way all time high,、uh, but not a lot of people truly understand what that is. Yep.、Um, but to me, the fact that you're wondering just because whether or not you're hearing about it all over the place, your friends are talking about it, and you can really contribute to that social、uh, discussion because you just don't understand it. Whatever your driver is, you're interested in EV cars. You're interested in SpaceX, or you just find this how this whole、um, internet, social media, whatever that catches your attention. It may not have to be technology,、mm-hmm. but I can assure you,、uh, if you started to dive in and do some Google search about whatever that subject that interests you, or that you have a big question mark, again, they don't have to be technology oriented subjects. They、mm-hmm. can be whatever that happens in your life. That I'm just encouraging you to say ask. Why am I seeing that? Why is the news saying something like that? And there's a couple of words in here I don't get,、mm-hmm. <laughs> right? That is always a starting point for 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 everybody.、Yep. So it's very practical, right? It's not really academic at all.、Um, and once you home in on something, you just say, you know what? It's probably good for me to at least look up this word because somehow blockchain is tied to this word Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is what I kind of are interested in.、Mm-hmm. But what is this blockchain term that keep on showing up? <laughs> 
nothing wrong with googling that just to get a little understanding about what that definition is、mm-hmm. and then from that point because it kind of anchors to what you naturally was wondering about that alone is the curiosity that will drive you down if you continue to look most of the things has a technology component、mm-hmm. behind it right and 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 that's where i'm saying is how far you want to take it but if you do go down the rabbit hole Somehow, that you everybody has a natural curiosity.、Um, you, you will be taken there just based on you wanted to, because you just keep on wondering one thing after the other, or you read certain things. To me, that's the best way.、Mm-hmm. Uh, if I were to force you to read news, you know, <laughs> five articles a day,、um, it's it's gonna be pretty painful、yeah. to try to consume all that because you just couldn't anchor to something you feel or you gravitate towards. So to me, that's a good start, right? Everybody wonder about something,、uh, especially students. Naturally, you're 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 in an academic、uh, environment,、mm-hmm. and then you're you haven't really have a lot of full exposure with a、uh, with a with a with a business world. So you, you you're still fairly a blank sheet of paper that a lot of things can go on there. Yeah. So every time you wonder about something, a dance, right, a musical.、Um, Start googling, and you will find there's technology that enables whatever that you just saw,、uh, and 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 you will understand a little bit more. Yeah, no, I think that's a really really important point, which is one is being willing to be curious、uh, overall.、Yeah. Like you have to curiosity is very very important. That's how not only technology you understand it, but also how you create it. Because by、yeah. by questioning the norm, you you kind of reimagine how the world could be. But the、yeah. other part that I think you brought up, which is really, really important, which is、um, <laughs> googling and YouTubing and then and doing your research out outside. I think I, I think that's a very important thing overall because academia has its purpose and it's to、uh, to teach a way of thought and like how to really conceptualize things. But academia does have a lag to it because technology in the real private sector moves so fast. It, it's very hard for academia to stay 100% step in step with it. Um, so it does require that that、um, ability to go out on your own and, and Google and be curious and and then take that knowledge, because majority of the stuff that I I do I took principles I learned in classrooms,、yeah. but that wasn't the practice that I did the application side of it. The application came from me Googling, practicing, seeing how it worked <laughs> in the real world, and then doing this cycle loop nonstop,、yeah. and it really helped me conceptualize things because. Um, the guys on this show they always give me crap because I know a lot about blockchain, for example, <laughs>、um, and and like th- since you brought that up, like it it's it's a funny subject overall because I talk about because I'm very curious about it all the time, and I and I research the concept of blockchain. I really never cared about crypto,、um, but whenever I bring it up to them, they always just think it's funny because I'm researching this, but I'm so curious about it. I want to know <laughs> every aspect of it. I want to know where it can go,、um, mm-hmm. and it's helped me kind of. Reimagine how things can be in the future,、um, yeah. and I don't think it will be very fast. But I do think that、uh, by understanding, it, it's not going to be a surprise when it does happen. I, I am、yeah. seeing how it is not some of the trends. Like right now, it's obviously big light because even like Jack Dorsey from Twitter and Elon Musk、yeah. bought one point two billion dollars、yeah. of <coughs> blockchain. I mean Bitcoin. It's in the news. But what what do you think about like the the danger of false information though? So there there is an imp- important side of the curiosity and, and and trying to understand these trends by researching it.、Mm-hmm. But also now online, especially because of social media, in, so, quote unquote influencers see this all the time on TikTok. There's people that are trying to articulate things they don't themselves know about it, but then they're、mm-hmm. pushing it across online mediums, and then people are consuming that and then taking that as being the reality. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point, Val.、Um, I think I, I'll go back to what you just stated about what what do we do as an educator, right? There's definitely a lag, and and, and to your later point,、um, because of that lag, it, it opens up opportunity for people to fill in the gap with potentially false information、mm-hmm. or、uh, information that was put out for alternative, you know, agenda. Yeah. <laughs> Because at the end of it, there's nothing wrong with putting out information as long as you drive up Bitcoin price. You know,、exactly. I own a lot of them. <laughs> It's to my own benefit.、Mm-hmm. So that definitely is happening a lot, just because of the lack.、Um, I, I will address the first kind of my thought on the academia side. Ten、uh, weeks taking the course is not gonna make you an expert. That's for sure. But but if we do our job right, 
right? We give you the fundamentals of understanding the pieces at work、mm-hmm. that enables something such as a database or such as a electronic commerce. We give you the pieces so that you have just enough、uh, as your as your foundation to then take it further,、mm-hmm. right? Go down the rabbit hole further. Now, if we do it really, really right, <laughs> throughout giving you that component. As an educator, we try to spark curiosity every step along the way, because we alone at this point don't know where a lot of this technology will take you,、mm-hmm. right? Because it's evolving; it's happening before our eyes. So we can't give you predictions of it. But sometimes, if you really look at it, if we do our job really well, we create a new generation of leaders that know how to take this beyond our time. And do something that we never imagined can be done,、mm-hmm. and we are very successful that we have、uh, provide the tools or the foundation. So, so I guess、um, at least from the educator per- perspective, that's what we strive for. In, in, in my courses, right, we really wanted to do that. You know, just just light those sparks to say, all right, now you understand how this works.、Mm-hmm. You start to have that. Dialogue, that example, that kind of just open the mind and kind of dream. Where does it go from there? It's not to say I open those up because I have answer. I don't. But hopefully, opening enough of those up, somebody will walk away googling <laughs> even more,、yeah. right? And, and back to your blockchain, I share just a quick story.、Um, uh, a few years back,、uh, I actually had a student before I even got involved about not trying to get my head around blockchain. I think six, seven years ago. One of the classroom, a student, you know, student always have the laptop, right?、Mm-hmm. I do my lecture, and then a bunch of people are doing whatever they're doing on their laptop. And then、so、we talked about the data, and then I can't remember what led to it, but Bitcoin came up, and then a student all of a sudden pop up, who never spoke in the class, right? <laughs> it's always on his laptop. Pop up and say, "Oh yeah, Bitcoin, right?" Now he's engaged.、Mm-hmm. So I said, "Oh, all right." And another student kind of says, "Yeah, what is that thing, right? It's all over the news." And this student all of a sudden just, you know. Started to explain, oh, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, blah blah blah, blah. and then、uh, it's it's on top of blockchain, and I'm trying to get my head around how to mine Bitcoin、um, on the blockchain. So you can tell, right? At that point, I just kind of let him speak for ten minutes、mm-hmm. because obviously he knows way more than I do. But that motivation, you can tell, he's curious. He dove into it,、um, and then he tried to learn and understand how this whole mining works. Uh, so long story short, I mean, you imagine this. You imagine that student where he is at today.、Mm-hmm. I don't know where he's at today, but but I can guarantee you, with that level of understanding, because he's curious, he probably see a lot of things way before most of us. Even as a professor, I couldn't have understood that. Right?、Yep. I can see it now. So I use that as an example in the story that I can tell. But at that time, a professor is going to be limited.、Mm-hmm. But yet, if I create the opportunity environment to let those sparks happen, and and continue to ask more questions, I literally just say, "Explain mining," and and obviously he says, "You know, I I don't fully understand it myself yet, but I'm learning it. I'll figure it out, right?" So if you keep on using questions to open that thought, then then the curiosity hopefully will will take hold.、Mm-hmm. Now, to your point,、um, I always kind of share this in the classroom. It's only about one Google away or three YouTube video away <laughs> for you to really want to learn something. That sometimes it will take you a quarter to learn. Yeah. <laughs> right. Now, here's the difference. It's not that we drag things out <laughs> for a whole quarter just to give you a three-hour worth of stuff.、Mm-hmm. No, it's because in that three hours. You are so motivated, you're gonna gravitate to everything that's communicated to you from those YouTube or those articles that you found out. Whereas inside the classroom setting, right, we had to give you a lot more context. We had to give you a lot more things. So, so how you consume information and how we deliver them sometimes it's all it hinges upon your motivation, right?、Mm-hmm. Your discipline of trying to consume them. And then it all again anchors back to because you're motivated, because you're curious for a very specific things, and and then YouTube and and Google leverage that opportunity to feed you exactly what you're hungry for, and that's where learning truly grab take、mm-hmm. hold inside a, a a person's learning experience. Now, in terms of misinformation, I would just I would just say that、um, at the end of it, unfortunately, that will continue to be a problem. Yeah. 
uh, because it's still a wild, wild west of what people can put out there. <laughs> and and especially students that kind of pretty much were born into this digital world and internet world, uh, it's hard for them to decipher. Like for my generation, right? Sometimes I look at Wall Street Journal, CA, and oh, those are credible sources. I can recognize enough names to know. Yeah, those that I don't recognize, I probably need to, to double check or I really think through what I'm reading here. Mm. Uh, but a lot of younger generations don't have that frame of reference to credible versus non-credible source. Pretty much everything they consume came from the internet, most of their learning experience, right? People that were born in the early 2000s and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's definitely critical uh, for them to, to have that ability to analyze what they're reading, yep. what is the intention, and, and, and then use their own analytical skills and the things they have learned to find the conclusion, is this trustworthy or is this valid? Or is this uh, a false argument? Now, I can also say, at the end of the day, having dialogues or or even shows like this, mm -hmm. right? Talk to people, yeah. talk to your network, talk to experts, validate what you believe you saw and listen to the counter arguments by anybody else who may have an interest, who may also read a lot of stuff. Uh, there's not really a right or wrong per se, but other than it won't hurt to validate what you're seeing or reading uh, and sometimes not just say you have to validate through another YouTube video or through another article. Um, there's nothing wrong with talking to professors, mm -hmm. right? Talking to, you know, experts like yourself uh, in a certain discipline that you do or to my discipline. Yeah. Those, those dialogues um, allow you to, to think differently and give you perspective as opposed to kind of really just buy into one single view just because you came across this and, and somehow it kind of speaks to what you wanted to hear and then you just ran with it. Uh, that's that's definitely dangerous. Yeah, yeah I think the, the concept of echo chambers, as you brought up, kind of like yeah. going into things where you you're you're looking for the answers you're already looking for and you want you want validation for it versus a, a conversation about it. I do think uh -huh. that's super important to always have. Um, so, for example, like my, my brother is very um, I, I'm, I'm very much like a visionary. My brother's a very like rationalist and like <laughs> anything that I think is like way out there. I'll always uh -huh. just see how he thinks about it first, because if I can get him to buy into it, then there's some uh -huh. ground there. If, if he just pushes back nonstop, then I'm like, maybe, maybe I'm thinking a little bit too big here and that's just not going to happen. Um, but I think that's important overall is to find those those groups or those people that can push back on your arguments or give a counter example or um, make you see the big picture because they're there everything uh, everything on the internet is the gray zone for me personally that, that's the way I kind of look at it and um, it's important to find information learn through that but then you have mm -hmm. to always then yeah double check with um, I was interested in this is there somebody I can talk to about this or go more into detail about it and that's actually one thing that LinkedIn's pretty great for because yeah. LinkedIn a lot of people want to talk about their expertise and you can search what people mm -hmm. are talking about or their own posts and stuff like that and, and yeah. join those conversations and, and get involved so I, I think there's a lot of mediums that students nowadays can really take their curiosity and put it to the real stage and, and then really learn um, which, which excites me overall because um, it doesn't just restrict from education being at a formal university. It takes it that like anybody can learn as long as you stay curious and, and, and you want yep. to continue to learn. Um, yep. But yeah, kind of going off of there. So what are some technology trends you personally see kind of, I mean, from your everyday work and, and overall uh -huh. that you think that students should be paying attention to? Um, I, I, have a, I have a long list myself, but I'm <laughs> kind of curious on your end. What do you think these, uh, what do you think students should really be paying attention to right now? Um, I'll give you a few, actually. Um, like I said, the last two years, I've been kind of spearheading to really look into technology and, and especially transform our county department. So I work for the county assessor, clerk recorder. Uh, so long story short, we're responsible for determining all the taxable value of properties here in Riverside. Mm -hmm. uh, Riverside County is the 10th largest county in the whole United States out of 3,000 counties. So we are huge in terms of population in terms of a number of homes that needs to be taxed as property tax. So every year, like last year, our value that we determined that's taxable is about $320 billion. Wow. So you can imagine the system that we deal with to track all this value. Mm -hmm. um, so so from that perspective, we have you know hundreds of appraisers that does the work. Mm -hmm. they, they determine the value of homes. Now, we don't actually go do 1 million appraisals every single year. 
uh, we, we only do a fraction of it. Uh, and the rest, we sometimes rely on mathematical mass appraisal algorithm. Um, so, but long story short, uh, because of that operation and because how we have always done it for the last 40 years, because only two years ago, we changed to a modern system. So prior to two years ago, we're still on a mainframe that was built before I was even born. Uh, so, so obviously now that we have a modern technology with a modern database, uh, there's a plenty of opportunity to say now where we where can we actually transform ourselves? Now we have a better system to accommodate the change, mm -hmm. right? Um, so coming back to your question, I am currently working on machine learning point uh, proof of concept with Amazon. So Amazon. So one, one of the benefits I do have at work is I'm at a level where I can just throw a hypothesis mm -hmm. <laughs> and, then, and then a team will come in um, to try to understand how to solve it. Yeah. Uh, now, granted, I usually get my head around the technology myself just because of my background. I'm just curious. So I learned enough to really say now my hypothesis, at least to me, is sound that I have a bunch of problem at work. And I believe this technology can meet it. And I even come up with a diagram of how I believe this technology can solve this. Now, I don't understand how to actually make it happen, but that's where Amazon and Microsoft, they're definitely very interested in giving me the expertise. So in terms of machine learning, artificial intelligence and machine learning is definitely one of the key topics out there. So that's, that's a very practical real life scenario that we just, uh, just work with another company that build a proof of concept. Uh, so how does that relate to, to the audience, right? So, so remember, right, now I'm the guy with a big ship and the net, mm -hmm. right? Tr rolling the boat around, uh, uh, right past your little boat. Um, so how does that impact you? Well, I I'll give you a, a personal story. So one of my buddy, uh, I won't name any names, <laughs> but <laughs> he wants to build something in his backyard. Uh, just like everybody else, it's my backyard. Why do I need to go file a permit and pay the government a bunch of money just to build a little shed or whatever they want to build in the backyard? So, so my friend is kind of contemplating, do I really need to go get a permit and pay all the fees and whatnot and, and so on and so forth? Nobody will ever know. And, and he, he kind of told me that as a joke because he know I work for the assessors, right? Our mm -hmm. job is to value anything that has a value on your property, we're taxing it. So if you build another pool, that has value to your property, we're taxing it. We, we want our share. So long story short is I kind of explained to him, I said, you're right. Yeah, nobody's going to come knock on your door to look at your backyard because there's a million houses. We can't do that. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what we are doing though. Every two years, we're flying over your, your neighborhood with pictures. So I may have a 2016 pictures of your backyard from you know 30,000 foot, whatever. I may have another 2019 picture and then we're using machine learning to detect changes based on the imagery differences. And then once we identify your backyard, all of a sudden have this thing that wasn't there three, four years ago. And yet our data has never shown you built something because you're supposed to file a permit before you actually build anything on your property. Mm -hmm. So guess what, right? The machine learning not only knows something's different, now, obviously, we cannot just go out and send people out to do a house visit just because there's something different in your backyard. So the machine learning really comes in to say, not only we know what's different, we know the size of it. So it's more than 200 square foot. And then I know it's not payment because I'm smart enough to understand what a payment would look like. And I know it's not just a greenhouse either. I know it's a new add-on structure that has similar roof which means it probably is going to be a dwelling. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you wouldn't put such an expensive roof over it. So the machine learning started to understand and start to adapt what kind of information it's trying to decipher for you that normally we wouldn't need to put a human being to eyeball it and compare them visually one property at a time. So, so that's literally what we're doing right now. And we just finished the proof of concept. The accuracy is over 90 plus percent. Uh, of identification. Uh, so, so that's a sampling size. So now we're gonna expand to the production side. So, so that's an example of, yes, you know, you can still say, <laughs> I don't, I know all that technology, the, the imagery detection machine learning doesn't really pertain to you. Well, to my buddy, right? He went out and got a permit yeah. because now he understood. So that's how you guys do this using technology. So I better not do anything crazy. I say, that's right. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. 
Uh, so that's how that's how things happen. Um, and, and another thing is definitely what we just talked about blockchain. Yeah. Uh, so people know it as more Bitcoin, but just for a quick definition, right? Blockchain is literally what enables Bitcoin to be what Bitcoin is today. So if we were to take a step back and say, why is it so important and what makes Bitcoin so valuable? Well, at the heart of it, people, why would somebody take real cash <laughs> to go buy something that they can never touch or feel? It's just a number on the screen. Mm -hmm. So you, so, so today's price is probably, I don't know, $46,000 per Bitcoin, so, <laughs> whatever like that, that is. It's crazy amount now, yeah. Right. Why would somebody literally pay $46,000 real money to buy a digit of one that shows up on the computer that I can't really touch or feel or count. That's exactly what Bitcoin is. People are putting real money to own a virtual dollar or one unit of Bitcoin. And that's the price for it. So if you really understand now, hopefully that piques your curiosity. <laughs> yeah, why would people do that, mm. right? Go Google it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, let, me, <laughs> let me give you some short answers right here. Um, People do that because the underlying system protects and people understands now that you cannot falsify that information of who owns how many units inside this computer, regardless of what you're trying to do. It cannot be truly hacked. It cannot be manipulated. It cannot be changed, updated. When it says you own this one unit, it is yours. And and that trust element is de was de uh, is delivered by the technology of blockchain. That's what makes Bitcoin work. It's the blockchain technology that truly hardened and protected the trust element, uh, where anything that goes into the blockchain, uh, think of it as a big database, that goes into the blockchain database, nobody can falsify it. It's immutable. Mm -hmm. It's the truth from that point forward. That's how Bitcoin's value is preserved. That's how people started to trust it and understand this system is why I am willing to put my hard cash into a digital unit. Now, if we take a step back and look at, okay, so the technology is the underlying um, realization or the capability of using technology to build trust. And what can prove that trust more than people's hard earned money? Mm -hmm. It's proven, right? The last thing anybody will want to risk is money <laughs> because that is very, very important to every single individual. Mm -hmm. But since the trust has been proven over the last, I don't know, 12, 13 years because of Bitcoin's existence, um, what else can we rely on this trust to make it happen in a society beyond just currency? Again, currency is one of those extreme that is hard for people to trust, right? So Val, if you ask me, hey, Ken, can I borrow $45,000? <laughs> I would say, mm, Val, I really like you, but I'm not sure if I trust you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, well, I saw that, that's, that's a quote right there. <laughs> but the, you can understand now, if we already proven we can trust with something so dear to us, mm -hmm. what else could we trust with blockchain technology? So let me give you a practical example again to our audience, hopefully, you know, probably a lot of students. If any one of you ever requested a transcript, <laughs> from the school, right? You can request an official transcript or an unofficial transcript, right? What's a what's an unofficial? Unofficial is they just print it out, they're gonna hand it to you. But when you apply for a master's degree admission, they probably ask you, don't give me an unofficial one. Part of your application, send me an official transcript. Official transcript is what? It's where the school says, all right, I'm gonna prepare your transcript because you asked for it and you're paying for it, but I'm not gonna hand it to you so you can go hand it to whatever college you're applying to. Because then that college won't trust you mm -hmm. <laughs> because you may have done something and changed some letters on that transcript that says you are earning higher grade than you were. Even though technically nobody, not a lot of people does that, but that's the trust element. They want the official one because they want your school to mail it directly to my school without you touching it. Mm -hmm. And not only that, Usually, I can't say this for a fact, it's been a long time since I see my transcript. <laughs> I don't want to see it, but <laughs> when you do request an official one, they print it on a specialty paper or banknote paper that you couldn't really buy. So to ensure trust, not only they don't want you to hold it and hand it over, they need to print it on a special paper that nobody else can get, only schools can. 
and then they put a seal on it that only the school will have a seal. So there's layer and layer of trust just for your transcript, which is just information for you to submit to go apply for it. So you see, that's how this whole mechanism of trust in the society. I can go into notary if any one of you have experience with notary, right? Why do you need to get a document notarized? Because nobody trusts you are who you said you are until I get a notary <laughs> yep. to go in and witness who you are and get your fingerprint so that I can trust you say who you are. So you see the whole industry has this trust issue that different businesses and processes were born just to facilitate trust of information flowing from one person to another or from one party to another. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the same trust that what we talked about earlier about Bitcoin. Blockchain, if blockchain can allow us to trust a monetary system, that's completely different. I don't need a bank to tell me, right, how much is in my account, right? I just trust what's on my computer because I can. Why can't we use blockchain to bypass all of that? Well, guess what? Let's go back to the transcript example. There is a company that currently are able to request your transcript using blockchain technology so that when I do send you a, so instead of giving you a bank note paper with your grades and everything and a seal stamp and a specialty paper, I will email you a PDF because Val, you requested your transcript from, I'm just gonna use UCR, mm -hmm. from UCR. So instead of doing all that labor, physical paper, print, and all that stuff, I'm gonna print it to a PDF and just email it here. And then you can just email that PDF to Harvard because you wanna to go to Harvard and get your PhD, right? Now, when Harvard receives it, Harvard's gonna look at it. Val, why did you send me a PDF? I, I can't use this, I can't trust this, right? You gotta send me an official one with a special paper and all that stuff, the whole nine yard. And then Val, you say, you know what? You can take this PDF and just go drop it on the website because this PDF is stamped by blockchain. Mm. Meaning at the time when UCR printed the PDF, we assume, I'm not making all this up by the way, we don't really actually do that. <laughs> well, I don't know if we are. <laughs> but when we create a PDF, instead of printing on a special paper, we printed Let's just for simplicity, we print it and then we we print it onto blockchain. Mm -hmm. The fact that I have done that, any change on that PDF would invalidate that PDF because blockchain will not be able to verify it. Yep. So so now that PDF becomes just as trusted as special banknote paper, right? Special envelope and, and, and special seal on that paper. Now you can trust the PDF. Now imagine how society will be so much efficient when we stop using paper, stop mailing to people, stop paying $30 for a transcript. And literally when you click and you pay on the line and you hit submit, matter of seconds, the PDF, your transcript was emailed to you without human intervention because e-commerce is just as straightforward. Yep. I don't need a human to involve anymore. So the level of efficiency, the, pen, uh, the personal convenience, schools convenience right you can see how that technology can be used um in, in in something as simple as just how we operate within a, a school now you expand that so i also have a, another point proof of concept that i'm working with a uh, um, with uh, amazon so amazon has an expert team that handles blockchain so that's what we're doing as part of my department uh we issue marriage license we issue death certificate we issue all your vital birth certificate that's what our department do as government and, and we do just that just like the transcript we put it on specialty paper we lock them and then we count them every night like they're cash so nobody will steal them because those paper are so embedded with trust mm -hmm. that if we lose one sheet of that and somebody decide to use photoshop and print whatever's on there they can literally take that sheet and go prove somebody's dead or somebody's born because they have that special paper that nobody should have. You can imagine the overhead of us managing just paper, special paper, right? Nobody touch it, right? Supervisor had to be there while other people count this. So two people have to sign off on it. Those are all just overhead because we have this trust issue. Mm -hmm. So my proof of concept is definitely say, just like the transcript. So that's kind of the model I'm following to say, why can I send you a PDF or your birth certificate? 
right? If I were to go through the blockchain to digitally seal the trust of it, uh, and we have actually built the the proof of concept system, and the technology is not the concern. Yeah. It, now, you know how to really roll that out and deal with the people, people mm -hmm. that still refuse to change, even though it's already here and then it's doable. Um, so that's a long way of answering your question, but uh, no, those are the two things that I definitely will look at. Uh, it's going to impact people's life in the next five to 10 years for sure. And I always equate that to think about your hearing blockchain today and think about your hearing artificial intelligence or machine learning today as if you were hearing this thing about World Wide Web and e-commerce the first time it pop up on some yeah. news article. We're kind of at that same time frame of a potential impact to how the society operates, just like what the internet has brought us, you know, for the last 20 years. Yeah, no, I, I think it's 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 really fascinating because exactly those points that you brought up is exactly what I've been researching nonstop. Uh, why I'm so fascinated by blockchain because it does change things in supply chain, it changes things in agriculture, it changes things in so many different facets of life because everything mm -hmm. is through trust. I mean, markets are created through trust mm -hmm. and that factor creates, as you said, a lot of inefficiencies in cost. I think one thing that I'm very curious on, on your opinion about is mm -hmm. with this technology trends, with machine learning, with uh, artificial intelligence, it will displace a lot of jobs. Same thing when it comes to blockchain. I mean, if, if you take out the trust elements, you're only going to need one person responsible to oversee that versus six people in office, you know, going through documents. Right. Yep. So do you where, where do you see that the, the job markets are going towards? Because like this, this is where it's always fascinating for me with like concepts like universal basic income, for example, because uh -huh. I really do think that this is going to have to happen. Like I, I don't think that we're as a society, there's going to be enough because we're going to be so efficient. And as you mm -hmm. brought up, like if one person in a in a boat can capture so many fish, you don't need a thousand fishermen. You need one <laughs> really good fisherman that can then help for a whole civilization and feed them. So what do you think is going to happen to this like societal shift in like the way we look at workers versus uh, efficiencies in markets and like capital? I, I feel like it's just it's mm -hmm. things are going to change so fast in the next five to ten years, which is so fascinating to me. But yep. it, it, it just keeps moving faster and faster because technology does, you know, evolve so quickly. So what do you think is going to happen with these job markets? Well, uh, to your point, I think you know, maybe I will, I will even kind of lay more foundation. And I, I think it's very valid, you know, question because I actually get that you know, quite frequent. Um, for example, right, you know, we always kind of grow up, um, you know, professions such as accountant, being a doctor, medical doctor, or being a uh a lawyer i mean those are highly skilled professionals that we always deemed um they make good money is because first of all it's hard to achieve that profession mm -hmm. right? it takes a lot of you know learning training and practice to be really good at those profession um, and therefore supply and demand um, and then the, the feel what they're doing requires a lot of I don't know if subjective is the right word, but just leveraging everything they have learned plus a lot of experience for them to make a conclusion. So let's just take an example of a, a medical doctor, a dermatologist, or or somebody who, who looks at x-rays, right, your lung. Um, so let's just say a medical doctor, very experienced to detect anomalies in your lung x-ray. Uh, whether or not they can spot a potential cancer or concerns and based on the scar tissue, whatever the x-ray shows. I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm just using this at a mm -hmm. high level. So throughout the whole career, maybe a medical doctor that specializes in that can look at what, 5,000, 10,000 patients. And then throughout that experience of not only they look at x-rays and have a diagnose, and then they follow up with all their, uh, their conclusion about what that may be, and they really verify it by doing you know, biopsies and tests and all that stuff. They build up such a humongous, uh, tremendous amount of exper experience. Mm -hmm. They become pretty good at their conclusion. So that's why their good doctors is hard to hire because it takes that level of experience to be really good at something that it takes a human mind to interpret. Right. Uh, same thing with lawyers. When they go prepare a case, they go through the, the law library to look at similar case, the presidents and look at how they make the argument, look at how the judge rule. They try to go through the last 10, 20, 30, 50 cases that's similar to the case they're preparing. Now, if, if you take a step back and look at both professions, highly 
prestigious professions mm -hmm. that we know uh, are very, very successful. They're about to be displaced because at the heart of it, people are naturally good at identifying patterns. Yep. Right, we're just human beings, right? That's why a lot of IQ tests are, are kind of focusing on patterns um, that determines how you know how, how much IQ you have. But at the end of it, let's just say a single doctor, how many X-rays that he or she has seen throughout their whole career can remember with high probability of accuracy mm -hmm. to be used every time they see a new one. Yes, they are really good at it, and their probabilities are increasing as more experience they have with more patients and seeing more x-rays. Same thing with lawyers. The more cases of this particular discipline, right, whether or not you talk about divorce, immigration, or just business law, uh, the more they do, the better they get. But let's just face it, throughout their whole career, they can do what? 100 cases? Mm -hmm. In case they researched three prior precedents, so 300, let's just say 1,000. But even with a lawyer with 1,000 experience of looking at all the cases, how much can they actually identify patterns? Mm -hmm. Because one thing that we fall short on as human beings is our memory doesn't work as well as our ability to logic, uh, to think, right, patterns. Now here comes machine learning. Machine learning is not about if then else, like a programming structure to say, I want to program this machine to do and simulate what a human would have done. It's way beyond that. Mm -hmm. It's try to take this whole universe of what happened and what was the conclusion and derive backwards of what the pattern was imposed that allow us to see what we have seen. So now if you develop using machine learning, a program that will help a doctor detect anomalies in the x-ray of a lung, I can, the, the, the difference is, <laughs> instead of just a couple thousand, the same algorithm can look through 1 million x-rays. Mm -hmm. And guess what computer do very well? It memorize every single one of them, yep. <laughs> as opposed to how a human couldn't. So when it derive at a pattern uh, that it will recognize anomaly and then equate that anomaly to predict what it is and, and how bad it is or how good it is, the, the probability will be higher than a very, very experienced medical doctor that has done looking at that for their whole lifetime. So that's a long way of explaining what's actually happening. So it's going to happen to a lot of professions mm -hmm. now. So I just kind of picked two of them. But that's where, again, curiosity, all the students in the audience, we're all in a different field right now. Well, some people is going to be engineers. Some people is going to be a marketing consultant, right? Mm -hmm. Some people is going to be IT. Some people is going to be a manager. But you can kind of see where this is going. Most of what we do that we feel the company need to pay us to do is something about that, but the subjective element of what we do. We identify pattern, we look at data, and then we try to make decision that we always feel a capable manager has to do. Mm -hmm. But machine learning is capable of reverse engineering what I have always done. And whatever the conclusion is, based on all the data that's able to find patterns, regardless of what I do, the probability of its conclusion is going to maybe higher than mine will be. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, we will all be impacted one way or the other. Now, going back to your last point, what does that mean to to individual? Right, we're all going to be out of the job. <laughs> no, by all means, I'm not going to uh, go that far. Uh, just look at the history, right? Uh, all the brick and mortars, a lot of the business, the malls. Right, all those uh, people back in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, we buy stuff, we consume stuff, we physically go to places to get those. But people say internet wipe out a lot of those jobs, a lot of those opportunities. But if you look at the economy still grew the last 10 years, mm -hmm. right? Post internet era that wiped out all the traditional business, the brick and mortar businesses. Um, so yes, we have witnessed that it happened already one time how technology literally just dominated and, and, and really wiped out a lot of traditional opportunities. Yeah. But it wasn't as bad as what people thought it's going to be end of the world for, for humanity, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? We're going to be taken over. No, it didn't happen. Coming out of that, if you look at it, we have a lot of new industries that we never thought. Yeah. Right. So you have, you know, data analytics, 
right? Fields, positions. You have SEO, search engine optimization, mm -hmm. right? Online marketing, social marketing. So people that used to be brick and mortar marketing specialists, managers, executives, it's just a different tool. Yep. Because at the end of it, technology is just a tool. Right. Uh, yes, it can do a lot more faster, cheaper. Uh, but along with that, there is still human element behind it that need to actually create the pieces to make that technology even come to play mm. in any organization. And those jobs are going to be new. So they won't be the same as before, but they will be new. Now, I'm not an economist to really dive into whether or not it's going to equate, right? Yeah. 10 people losing their job in one industry and you're going to have 10 new newly created. But I can always say that's where um, that's where this particular discussion is very fitting is because we nobody can ever predict the career field that you want to go in will not be replaced by something. Yeah, I would say it's always safe to assume it will, because only through that you will continue to try to make sure you're on top of things that's happening around you. Mm -hmm. And maybe in terms of information system and technology and then be curious what does that mean to me right what does this blockchain mean to me is there is it an opportunity or is it a threat right we all learn swot analysis <laughs> in probably multiple courses that we have taken this is where you apply them you yeah there's no more important place to apply swot than to yourself you learned it you understand exactly what swot does but not a lot of students understand you probably should use that to yourself first mm -hmm. um and then if you were to look at it from that uh, from that lens, any technology that may replace what you wanted to go into, what you want to become, you will see the threat of it. But then you flip the threat, you will immediately identify opportunities just as as fast. Mm -hmm. So I think um, at the end of the day, I think the society as a whole will be OK. But uh, but I do personally believe that hinges on just all of the all of us willing to to learn it to understand it and, and see what's coming and not not like what just happened right yeah <laughs> not, not be complacent but uh but be curious and, and stay ahead of it yeah, yeah I, I mean i definitely agree with those points i would say the one counter example i would have though is like the mm -hmm. difference between the retail move into online mediums using the World Wide web for example it wasn't a technology tool that could then do the job of the individual. It was just a new form of the individual's job overall. I think this time, mm -hmm. the reason why I am a little bit more pessimistic overall, and I do think that there are going to be things like UBI that has to be enacted is because um, a machine learning algorithm, for example, can then, or AI, for example, your self-driving cars, it just displaces so fast and so quickly yeah. in the areas where you can't just re-educate a population to then do the job that is more technical and I, mm -hmm. that that's the part where i think that shift is just happening so fast that mm -hmm. for example like for one um machine learning algorithm you can remove eight lawyers for example the eight lawyers then to then cr be able to create you don't need as many people to then create the technology as the technology is going to be displacing out but at the same time we don't know like there are going to be definitely yeah. new industries that will come out Hopefully there will be, but I do think that there will be kind of like a, at least a decade kind of a hardship for a lot of people mm -hmm. because of that kind of transition across. I think yeah. after that will be fine and it'll, it'll get better. But I think that's where I definitely hope that more like uh, congressional representatives and senators and, and, and the presidents, they, they really do start looking at what is going to happen because uh, to both of our points, if you're not curious and you're not doing anything about it right now, Mm -hmm. it will be too late i i do i do have a lot of uh, hope of how people are like actively learning about this technology but it the i think the gap is just it just grows faster <laughs> and faster and faster between yes. the, like academia as well as the professional world as well as how technology and the everyday american how much they can understand what's happening mm -hmm. um so i mean there are pros and cons on both sides but we'll see you don't know until I, it happens <laughs> I, I, de I definitely agree i think i think Again, humans, right? We don't adapt to change as, as, as quickly as what, what things are happening right now. And there's no, that's a problem. I, I completely agree. And that's a problem. Again, I think I personally, just maybe just because I teach, mm -hmm. um, it, it has to be solved at, at the academic route because everybody will come through that route, K through 12, or then you do your you know college and you do your master. If we were to ever have a shot at preparing people to handle change better or faster 
I think at the end of it, that is the key area to do it, right? Because you know, once once you're hardened in certain experience, right? For me, yeah, I think for some of my folks at work will probably say Ken is very stubborn about something, but but that stubbornness came from all this time I've been spending in whatever environment I've been.、Mm-hmm. Those are detrimental for me to change that. But but earlier in your learning journey, your academic journey, that's where. How, so I guess my long long way of saying this,、uh, I'm, I'm coming to the point is, how do we prepare all of the students to learn fast,、mm-hmm. to learn faster, and and how do we make that the norm? Because what you just said is at the heart of it. If people couldn't learn how to learn faster, yeah. That gap will continue to be widened, and and right now it's it's not it's not a very clear whether or not all the the K twelve or or even a lot of colleges are are achieving that goal,、mm-hmm. because right we still have subjects and things that we go in and 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 we fill them as a production line. We train you the methodology, and now go out and just kind of rubber stamp and do what I trained you to do.、Mm-hmm. And, and there's still a good portion of the discipline or education that's. Delivered that way, yeah.、Uh, because not not everybody in this particular field have figured out how to deliver that mission. How do I help everybody learn faster、uh, through the subject that I have to teach?、Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just because I'm assigned to teach this, so it, it's going to be a balance for educators to find how to deliver that.、Um, so so yeah, I definitely hear you. That's that's going to be a tricky one. Now going back to your. Government involvement. I'll give you a live example.、Uh, I just mentioned right technology that I just did with Amazon. Prove I can give you a PDF and you can trust it.、Mm-hmm. So that PDF can be your your deed to your home, your title, or your birth certificate. Right, very sensitive stuff that people rely on to establish decisions of conducting business, insurance, right,、mm-hmm. whatever the reason that they want to see proof of those documents.、Um, The biggest hurdle is not actually the technology. So Amazon already did that with it, with me. It's not really adoption because you know me and my my boss, who's very open minded,、uh, we can drive adoption in our department.、Mm-hmm. Our biggest hurdle is actually sacramental, <laughs> because we follow regulatory、uh, laws, code from sacramental state laws, how to do this business, how to issue this important records of of citizens. Mm-hmm. We are the stewardship of those records for Riverside County, and there's 58 counties, so everybody kind of has the same role. Yeah. Inside the regulatory、uh, laws, I guess I'll just call that,、um, it's very specific. It actually outlines you. We have to use banknote paper, special paper. Unless we change the law, I can't just say I want to use PDF.、Mm. So, so even though everything is there. That's not the challenge. Is how do I change the minds up north? <laughs> so that's something me and my, my 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 team and my and my boss were now strategizing because we're so determined that we have to keep up with the times, even as a government entity, because the whole generation is already there expecting it. Yep. And 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 the only thing that hinders us is whatever was written. Fifty, sixty, whatever, however many year ago that law was written, and and nobody, nobody feels the urgency needing to change, even though the population has already gone past that stage. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's it's com- it's complicated. There's always this kind of <laughs> dynamic kind of push back, back and forth. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, I definitely see that. I mean, it, it was the same thing with like.、Um, How like government assistance work with like PPP? I mean, if you looked at like the unemployment office web portal, for example,、oh, or like、yeah. <laughs> how how they went about the PPP is just like they're using. They didn't change the unemployment、uh, website. I think it was like from the '80s or something like that. Like like、uh-huh. it was like the old school. Like even before internet was really a thing, they already had like a, like an old school portal system. <laughs> and the last update they had was like in '97. Um, so that that set, that tells me a lot because it it, it caused problems. Like it, it、yep. caused a lot of lost money and all these things. And I always think it's interesting because when I hear on the governmental side, it's like I don't want to invest into that because it's gonna、uh, cost more money. It was like, well, actually, you're saving money because in the long term,、uh, you don't have these like bad inefficiencies that you already do <laughs> have in the overall. 
side of it. Yep. But yep. yeah, it's it's a nonstop battle. But I, I do think it <laughs> requires as as citizens do get more educated, understand where they want to go, they can push back on representatives. And I think that's why it's it's so important to be uh, knowledgeable about politicians as well, and knowledgeable about yeah. politics, and and then be involved into it. Um, in, in, in any facet, even if you want to be more individual and in all these things, you have to understand that that blockade does impact you in one way, shape or form. Um, yeah. So by being active, it, it does have a lot of impact to it. But um, yeah, I mean, o- overall, I mean, I think we, we really dove into uh, technology overall. I hope I hope our audience could could follow our conversations into <laughs> the, the world of technology because it is is complicated, but it, it requires that curiosity that we discussed. Um, yeah. But yeah, so the the way that we always end the show um, mm-hmm. it, to really to really allow people to understand that no matter what your journey is in life and where you want to go, um, everybody kind of goes through through failures and hardships, and I think that's a very important thing to recognize because one part of that is that learning that you get out of it is really what exemplifies where you get in the future because it's it's how you react to those situations, not how you dealt with it at that time. So. Um, the floor is yours. We always end with a failure story. If you have uh-huh. a story that you'd like to share with our audience for today. Um, sure. Yes. Um, so, so probably the biggest one, I, I'll give just a little bit of background just mm-hmm. so you, you understand. Um, I mean, just being an immigrant, right. The family coming over from, from Taiwan in the eighties, um, I was really small, but it's always been a struggle. Just try to make a living. Um, so so I guess a humble beginning, kind of seeing the struggles of my parents, uh, try to make end meets and so on and so forth. So you fast forward me going to, to school and college. Um, quite frankly, I, now that people who know who I am and what I do, uh, not a lot of people know the background. Mm. Uh, so if you would have met me during my high school, college year, you would never thought <laughs> that you know, this is what I do today. Uh, it, it won't equate. So let me just leave it at that. Uh, but but throughout that background, that hardship, I guess, for some reason, uh, I always kind of tell my students, you know, sometimes I do things for the wrong reason in the early days. Mm-hmm. And now at my age, I understand why and I want to make it, you know, an uh, experience, a teachable moment. Uh, so same thing. So when I go into college, I don't know why I need to finish college other than if I don't, my mom will probably kill me <laughs> because everything they have done is about this whole education here in the US. So that's the only reason I stay around inside college. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you know, I always had to work. I would have just go work because money was just so important, right? For the family, for myself, because growing up, that's always the fight. That's always the concern. That's always mm-hmm. the worry. So everything's always about money. So. As soon as I can go work, I just wanted to go work more and more and make more money to to take care of whatever. So I really never understood why uh, I need to learn all this stuff. Um, but I stay with it and try to just make sure I live up to parents' expectation that I'm going to graduate from college. Uh, as soon as I done that, that kind of wrong motivation, I guess, wrong driver of me, me uh, went into IT. I started doing programming or multimedia and whatnot. And then the first moment that I see an opportunity, I went out and started a business Mm -hmm. two years after college, just because I know how to program. And all of a sudden, everybody's looking for people that can program websites. So my sister is a great graphic designer and I am a programmer. So boom, I said, fastest route to to have financial stability is go be your own boss. So I did that. And, And as you can imagine, uh, I we immediately got the first client. I remember that first client um, was Con Air, right? Those those hair dryer mm-hmm. that you see. I didn't realize they were that big that time, but but they hired us, just me and my sister, and we built their website way back. And then and I thought, hey, this can work. And then we got another client. So I was a couple of months in, we're feeling pretty good. Again, not really applying any of the business degree and classes that I've taken. Those are just, I passed the test, they're, they're purged, right? <laughs> the knowledge has no bearing to what I'm about to do right now. Um, and then all of a sudden, I, I got this partner uh, that's very successful in a particular industry. I prototyped something that I kind of innovated out of my multimedia programming capability. And then I applied it to a very traditional industry because they hired us to build their website. Once I learned what they do, I invented this very unique way of showing what they have on the internet mm-hmm. that nobody done before. 
So I, I was really happy. I said, all right, we, we're going to charge an arm and a leg for this, right? So I went in there and presented a, a presentation to all their executive management. That night, they invited me and my sister to dinner. And they asked what, you know, it's a company, just both of you, I said, yes. They said, what do you want to do with it? I said, I want to, I want to grow. I need more client. And they said, you know what? You know, I would like to be a partner with you. You know, and what do you need to grow? I mean, I was already kind of floored at that time, right? mm-hmm. being very inexperienced. Uh, but yet having a president of a company inviting me to lunch and talk about they want to be part of this, your business is going to be really successful, but and then we wanted you to, you know, to help you. So, so I just threw out a number. I said, you know, $150,000 to start expanding. Um, so literally over dinner, the check is pretty much written. I don't know why I asked for that much other than it's huge amount of money that, I, you know, to me at that time, it's like, it's like a million dollar investment. <laughs> so, um, and then you fast forward a couple months, uh, we move in. So he incubated us, uh, the company did. Uh, and then me and my sister worked from there. They provided us their sales team that's going to go out because they know the industry. Mm-hmm. They know the players. They're going to go out and try to help us more advertise. At the end, let's just fast forward. At the end, how it ended after less than a year was I learned that they never intended to help me grow. Mm-hmm. They just don't want anybody else to have the same capability. Uh, so when I started to realize what was happening, again, just purely inexperienced. Uh, and then we went into not really a true arbitration, but when I wanted to depart, uh, it, we were threatened, me and my sister were. And again, at that time, I was scared, mm-hmm. right? I couldn't afford a lawsuit. I couldn't hire a lawyer, <laughs> right? All that is just very scary process. And then they say, all right, we're going to have an arbitration. I'm going to have a lawyer to discuss all the stuff that you created should belong to me because you use my money. Mm-hmm. So literally we sat down. I just say yes to everything that the lawyer says because there's, I don't know how to deal with it. I don't know what I can do. So pretty much overnight, I kind of just lost all the dreams about what I can do with that thing. And, and, and I think I also feel pretty sad that I dragged my sister with me mm-hmm. <laughs> to kind of go through all that. But so that's kind of, to me, it hunted me uh, ever since. But my personality is never really to, to just uh, be scared of anything. Um, so I guess just one way my personality is still kind of helped me out of it. And I kind of told myself, um, I need to know why. I need to know how this actually is supposed to work because what I have gone through shouldn't be the normal thing, mm-hmm. right? So that's where I started to be curious. <laughs> I started looking to, all right, I remember I took a business law class before. Where's that book? <laughs> all right, I started to say, now I truly understand. All right, so that's what cash flow is all about. I remember learning that for some big Walmart corporation exercise for the homework. I should have probably used that for my little tiny business to know how much I need. Mm-hmm. I probably need to put something in writing at the beginning of it, like what business law has taught me to do. So I started to go in through such a huge failure at that time, even though it's no, not not a big business at all, it's just it's just a an attempt to start something that failed. Yeah, I started to tie it back to so that, that's where all the stuff not all a lot of classes I have taken that's where they supposed to plug in. Mm-hmm. Uh, that probably would you know resulted in different negotiation and different ending for this little venture that I started. So I really, you know, and, and because of my curiosity, wanting to know why, why it happened that way, I started to really understand. So that's why we need education. Mm-hmm. And and thinking back and not to really fault anybody, it's definitely not the educator's fault. But a lot of times I do feel we miss that connection. That's why you probably remember, right? In most of my classes, I always, I always told people, I'm trying to make you sure you feel everything I'm teaching, what what does it mean to you? Yeah, yeah we can talk about Walmart, or Amazon all day long. But it's so so disconnected, right? It's just some big company using this technique. I really feel if somebody would have educators are able to connect that to me, then every ever since and everything I in, embark on, I wouldn't know how to apply some of those principles that was taught in most of the classes to just make sure I'm on the right track. At least I have a good solid starting point. So after all that learning, um, I, I learned, I, I went back and did all that. So fast forward a couple more years, you know, I became a consultant to help small, small business startup. Mm-hmm. 
just because I don't want anybody to go through what I have gone through. Mm-hmm. Because again, it's not a lot of money, but um, but for somebody who has nothing and thought I had a shot at something, it was pretty devastating, <laughs> uh, to say the least. And but but it's all good. I think it made me better. It, it really allowed me to even be a better teacher right now. Mm-hmm. Because I, I really tried to drive what I thought was missing, the missing link, uh, for a student to understand why they're learning some of this stuff. It's not to, not to say everybody need to learn everything from every class and apply everything. Mm-hmm. So I was to kind of tell the students. For example, I only remember speech class. Uh, general education, you have to take a speech class. The only thing I walked away that I remember and figured out the importance of applying is just one statement. Anytime you are going to talk to people, analyze the audience. That's mm-hmm. all I remember, and I have used that one sentence <laughs> throughout my whole career. Now I'm one of the you know pretty efficient facilitator of all kinds of meeting because I always prepare based on how I know the audience can consume what I'm yeah. about to say. It's not how I want to say it. It's just from that one principle. So every class, if everybody can walk away with just homing in on one principle. And practice it to their own personal life. That's it. You'll go a long way. Um, that that will probably save a lot of disconnect. That that would cause some you know some experience that I had to go through to realize the, what I probably should have realized early on. Why we're being educated. Mm-hmm. No, I, I I really appreciate this story, especially uh, myself as as an entrepreneur. Like I, a lot of the stuff you were talking about, like. I, I luckily have had mentors to help me out with like business law and all these kinds of things and make sure to do it correctly. And but it's 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 hard. And and, and there's a, there's a lot of when you look back, you're like, oh, I should have done it that way, or I should have done it that <laughs> way. And it, it's it's really unique hearing it from from your perspective, being in those shoes, and then and then where you are today. And exactly, I I can see that coming across now how you you teach. Um, uh-huh. it, it, it makes a lot of sense because you you do emphasize to focus on one topic in the classroom and <laughs> just take have one takeaway. But no, very much appreciate you sharing that story. I, I think that helps a lot of students that might kind of question like, why am I at, at, in school right now? Why am I why am I trying to do this education um, when I'm trying to do all these crazy things in my life? Yeah. Um, and it, it helps them rationalize it. But um, but yeah, overall, I, I'm. Very thankful that you're willing to come on to the brew today uh, and and join us and have have this conversation about technology entrepreneurship and really where the world is going. Um, um, is is there uh, what classes are you teaching for uh, spring quarter if, if students would want to take any courses with you? Uh, I believe I just got. I'll be teaching database again, so business one seventy three. Um, I think I will be teaching in the MBA class, e- electronic commerce seminar. Yep. So I'll have those two, one in the undergrad and one in the in the graduate program. Absolutely. Well, for those for those listening, definitely take Ken Wang's classes. I, <laughs> I had him for database for MBA, and it was a fantastic course. Um, Thank you. But uh, overall, this has been a great show. Um, and we're just going to close it out for today. But uh, thank you for tuning into The Brew.